I think Earthquake Leia is about to happen. Boom, 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 boom. I love Leia. You do? Yeah, I do. I just can't be near her. It's not that I don't like her just because I'm allergic. I don't think I've ever heard you say you love Leia. Oh, well, I think she's hilarious and I think she's just so silly and large and cuddly and sweet. <laughs> You're crying. That's like a really, really, that means so much to me. Here's the thing. Even when I've been over to your apartment, which has maybe been like two or three times in my life because I'm allergic to her, I've tried to call out to her. She's the one that's skittish. And so she, because I'm new and she hasn't spent much time with me. So all the times I've glimpsed her in person, I'm like, hi, Lay, And then she runs away. But I would hold her and cuddle her and then just immediately go shower. You would? Yeah. I don't dislike cats. I I touch cats cats out in the world like when I when I encounter them and then I regret it because then I start to my throat starts to close and my eyes start to weep but it happens at least once a year where I have to like rush home and because of my own undoing well now that I know that this is a possibility I feel like okay this this is reminiscent of the time that Brian told me he loved me and it was because <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this is just All happening emotions. again all of the emotions. My partner and, loves you. I love yes. your soulmate. <laughs> and it very much was like, Brian, uh, hey, anyone, this is a little like secret uh, insider scoop if you would like to know. If you want Brian to love you, give him a chocolate chip cookie. It is like how when you're approaching a dog that like doesn't quite, is kind of shy, but you give that dog a, a biscuit, a treat, the dog is immediately warmed up to you and loves you that is brian that's brian <laughs> give him a chocolate chip cookie he'll love you forever he'll love you forever and he'll tell you anyway hi uh this is two girls one ghost two girls one ghost and we are your ghostesses that is corinne i am sabrina and this is part three of our sixth year anniversary series sewed and our 30th birthday month celebration yeah and you know what i just realized what did you realize is we so we were pre we are pre-recording a bunch of episodes and so we've been recording them out of order as we finish the research and we all re we already recorded the episode that comes out around your birthday i never sang you happy birthday but i'm gonna do something really big on your encounters birthday really big well like i i don't know i'm gonna try my best like opera rendition of happy birthday and oh my gosh i look forward to it do everything i i can to make it special <laughs> I okay well real quick I um wanted to do a little like um fashion show for you and for everyone who's watching on YouTube okay beautiful beautiful love it the conjuring house the conjuring house love the back it's so good I'm so proud of this do I look like a model? Yeah, you do. I was thinking, I was like, I want to buy 20 of these shirts so I can have them for memorabilia. Uh, may I model for a moment? Please. Ooh. Have it in the blue. Oh, you can't love see me it. I'm far, but I'll, I'll jump up. I also have sweatpants shorts on. <laughs> Wait, me too. We're matching. I, know, I said I also, yeah, we are matching. Wait, Annoying, we can do, right? wait, all right, you show the back, I'll show the front, and we'll do like a little like. <laughs> Did you just twerk? I, I did something. Do you know <laughs> so, how to twerk? I do, but it, I can't. Okay. It, it just has to come. I can't Front me back. Up. Wait, okay. Can you twerk again for me? Absolutely not. Oh, man. People saw all that they would get. Okay, everyone go back and replay it over and over and over. Oh, my gosh. Let's <laughs> we'll make one of those. Boom, boom, like a, a gif, like the, uh, yeah. the boomerang. A boomerang. <laughs> <laughs> Christina? <laughs> Oh boy, I hope it looked good. Because I said, yeah, I can twerk. What if I can't? And it's just like, uh, uh, uh. awkward. I, I want to add that noise to it too. Um, <laughs> this, okay, yeah. So we've been doing this for six years. I'm really curious. I know a lot of people have sent us their hauntings that they've experienced while listening to our podcast. But what about like favorite episodes? Not even just scariest episodes, but like episodes that you love. Favorite loved. episodes. Yeah, for because we've been doing this. This is what this is episode two hundred something. Yeah, what's your favorite episode of a researched episode? Hmm. I really love paranormal games. You love paranormal games, yeah. I do, but I also love okay, and I think this is just because, and we've talked about this before, but because of how much 
S-H-I-T we went through to record just this one episode, but it embodies, I think, the entire six years of our podcast. Mm. It was episode 40 something where it was about Hollywood hauntings or something like that. We had to record it, re-record it three, four times. And you yeah. and I were both working full-time jobs. You had to take a sick day. So keep recording it. I had to go rent a room from like our college library. Yeah, go ask a strange college kid to let you in the library and make you a reservation at the room. Exactly. In the and we had to record room. it so many times. Mm -hmm. And as terrible as it was, I think that was the moment when I look back at our podcasting business, our relationship, our hobby, our fun company we've created. I think that is a moment that proves the integrity we have, the passion we have yeah and it proves the just how much we willing to do it yeah like we could have very easily at so many points given up totally or gotten frustrated with each other yeah because i feel like that happens a lot when people get upset or they're stressed out or, or what have you oftentimes the default is to take it out on someone who's closest to you or involved in the thing that you're working on and i feel like we never do that we're very lucky a lot of people have to really work on their business relationship <laughs> and i don't know i feel like not everyone has a ghost that they can blame blame their issues on <laughs> that's true we, we do have a scapegoat ben. and it's the ghost <laughs> we're like cars it's the Sven is basically our therapist. <laughs> we bully Sven. Yeah. I think is what happened. <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite episode? Mm, I think the episode that sticks out to me is when you did the Divic Box and I did the Crown of Cat Skills because I just felt like those were two two topics that were both so incredibly interesting, equal parts interesting and, and scary. And we both did them like at the exact same time. And so I thought, I think that was my favorite episode because it made me, I was excited and fearful at the same time. Reagan Dana's movie comes out August 12th. Yes. The Unbinding, which is about the Crone of Catskills, they made a documentary where they re they learned all that they could from the entity that was attached to the Crone of Catskills, and then they returned the Crone back into the Catskills Mountains in New York. And so there's a whole documentary about it that they've been working on for years. Because I remember, it must have been a year ago, that on our In Paranormal News episode, I had mentioned that I saw Greg tweet about making the documentary. So of course, Sabrina and I reached out and we're like, hey, you want to ever give us a hey. screener? <laughs> uh, so well, maybe, maybe we'll get one. Hopefully we maybe. do. But it is in theaters very shortly. They're doing, they're doing a premiere in LA on August 12th, which I'm, or not in LA, it's in Santa something. It's 30 miles away from here. You should go. I don't have a car, but. Oh, also I think. I, I want to. I don't know if they might have already sold out tickets, but I know. People, can should check. I people should check. How cool, though, that they get to do a premiere in a movie theater. And then I believe it's going to hit streaming services so we can all rent it and perhaps do a watch party together because that would be so fun. I feel like this is the this is a, <laughs> a movie slash documentary that Sabrina, you and I equal equally are uh, invested in. Like, I feel like we've been waiting for this for so long. This is highly anticipated. It's almost like that's another highlight of our podcasting career. Like seeing something we talked about so long ago have this like big conclusion of some kind. Yeah. Which doesn't we really happen never get that. paranormal. Yeah. Right. It's so cool. Yeah. Thank you, Greg and Dana Newkirk for, <laughs> for being the highlight of our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Their careers equal our happiness. Yes. And if you don't know Greg and Dana Newkirk, we highly recommend following their podcast oh the haunted objects podcast so it's good so good they're just so incredibly intelligent so i mean the stories that they have you think corinne and i are haunted my gosh greg and dana like are on another plane i mean they've been doing witchy ghost hunting things since they were teens so they are so incredibly experienced i want a rom cam like i want on like a romantic not even comedy. I just want a movie about their relationship and how they started. This is like, are we fangirling? We are. We're huge fans. I feel like, I mean, anyone who went to our Portland and New Brunswick show this past spring, I literally just talked about Greg and Dana Newkirk the whole time. Yeah, we're huge fans of them. They're, they're 
what Ed and Lorraine Warren were for people a few decades ago. They're that for us. But they're also like course correcting. Exactly. They're appropriate for for modern day (laughs) for these times. They're very, very respectful of all of the entities and objects they come in contact with. Yeah. And they're just freaking cool. So freaking cool. Oh, let's ask them to adopt us. Oh, I would love that. Right. I just found out I live in a commune. Yes. You texted me this. I was very jealous, but I was very happy for you. (laughs) And I wasn't even seeking it. And I wound up in a commune. And you and I have talked about this. Because communes have good vibes. This is why I always say I want to live on a commune. Okay, so it's not technically an operating commune, but it was built as a commune back in early 1900s. And it's this like adorable little community that's with like hidden within like the Santa Monica streets and it has this beautiful courtyard. There's butterflies everywhere. There are five crows that live here. I have a passion fruit tree on my patio. And also looking at the photos you've sent me, there's absolutely no indication that you are in Santa Monica. Like I've been to Santa Monica a hundred times and I cannot believe something. It's like this little Eden. It's like this little paradise that's just exists there. But yeah, so back in the, I don't, I have to get, I have to do more recon, but Peggy came over the other day Man, I can, well, I'll fill you in on all of their life details in our personal life conversation, which we have, which we scheduled because we're so busy right now. (laughs) So you and I needed to schedule. Friendship time is scheduled for 3.30 p.m. Eastern (laughs) today, Monday, July 24th. But Peggy came over and we were just talking and she was just saying how long she's lived here. And then it's just people who buy these homes, they don't sell them. Like they own them for a really long time. There's a woman who works for NPR who's a journalist who lives here. She's incredible. I mean, everyone here is so beautiful and like wonderful. Like, I want you to one day buy the place that you're in. That would be a dream. I would love to. That would be my dream. But, um, oh, Maggie. Oh, that was Leia hissing. Yeah. I thought it was, I was so confused because it sounded like, you know, when you like open blinds. Oh. And you pull them. So I was so confused. I was like, wait, do you have a communal blind with whoever lives next to you? <laughs> no, but now she's like doing this Maggie. to herself. She's like standing in the windows and looking for Maggie. Yeah. Maggie's a cat, right? Another cat. Yeah, Maggie's a cat. Okay. <laughs> Maggie <laughs> stands up. The only thing about my commune is that Maggie does not like me. We all get along so peacefully, but Maggie the cat will come sit at my door and not let me leave. She'll hit we... and swat. Oh. And she's like, you stay in there. You stay so where you bizarre. belong. <laughs> Maybe it's because she... I mean, did other people have cats? Is it is she associating you with the one with person Leia. who brought a cat into her space? Mm-hmm. Yeah. She's like, oh, how dare you? This was my sanctuary. This woman who used to live here, she had a cat as well. And Maggie just stopped hating her. Even now when Allie comes to visit, Maggie knows and like doesn't like her. It's so crazy. Cats are smart, right. man. So yeah, it used to be a commune. There was a woman who lived here when she was growing up. And her parents went to do like a service trip in El Salvador and they left her for three years to be raised by the commune. What? I can't even imagine. That's really cool. But I'm very curious, like what life was like and who lived in the commune at that time. I know. I know. I want to do like a history report on this. Yeah. And apparently the front house, people get vibes like ghosts. You should plan a little seance night with your neighbors. Well, just like Emma did with her neighbors, our our Houston listener. I'm very down. This is also very much like a neighborhood where it's like if someone's out of town, like they're like, hey, come stay over here. Will you watch my dog? Will you stay here for a little bit? Like, will you just stay here a night or two? So I might sleep in a haunted house. That's so nice. Yeah. Yeah. If you get a turn sleeping in every single one of the houses, that will be. (laughs) That's the dream. Maybe they'll start blaming you for any of the hauntings. They'll be like. (laughs) Don't let Sabrina <laughs> sleep over or dog sit because weird vibes so will be will there be when she leaves. Yeah. <laughs> your house will be haunted. Oh, this is so cool. This is so, I feel like your life is just really coming together beautifully. Nice. <laughs> but Leia, Leia and Maggie. Leia. Are absolute enemies. Why are you doing this to yourself? Leia. Oh should I take God. a video? We can insert it. Yeah. Leia. 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 Come on. Come on. <laughs> Maggie's literally 
hands up on the wind, like on the side of the house to put it closer to the window. Oh my gosh. She's taunting her. Just let him, let him hiss it out. We have so much personal conversation to have. We can't take from that time. <laughs> well, this is going to be a long episode because. Okay. This was, this is part three of our Bigfoot episode. And I was like, oh my God, this means I have, th- these are my final moments to try to, to convince put the spotlight everyone. on Bigfoot and try to, yeah. Well, here's the thing. I, I wish I could redo the first part. Why? Because I wish I provided more evidence to convince people of Bigfoot, but I was really just like. You were laying the land. I was laying the land. It was a wishy-washy land. You were planting some seeds mm-hmm. and we've fertilized, we've watered, we've had some we've had some fungus and now yes we're fruiting you're fruiting i think that's how agriculture works if you don't go to harvest i will be so upset (laughs) (laughs) everyone must leave here believing in bigfoot how many people have compared belief in bigfoot to agriculture let us know let us know we are unique (laughs) (laughs) we're so special (laughs) Oh, All righty. Part three, baby. Buckle Let's up. Let's do it. Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Yeti, Abominable Snowman, Skunk Ape, Grassman, Boyfriend, <laughs> Yowie, Monster. This creature has many names, many coats of fur, and many footprints left behind on Earth's soil. Yet its existence remains a mystery. What is Bigfoot? How are there tens of thousands of reported sightings over human history expanding across the globe, mostly in the Northern Hemisphere, from the highest, deadliest mountain peaks to the densest, most humid swamps? How can a creature so large outsmart humans, evade our wildlife biologists, and escape from the most experienced hunters? It's a question that leaves many people to doubt if Bigfoot is even real. Is there a large, hairy, and potentially dangerous species on the loose? Or have our human minds created a monster of our own, reminiscent of the type of species we were two million years ago? Are Bigfoots a reflection of our past and our fear of returning to a more uncivilized type of life? Or are we fascinated by them because they show just how small the gap is between being human and being more animalistic, being an ape? We as a species love to view human beings as separate from animals. We're greater than animals. We are intelligent. We possess self-awareness. We build complex structures. We communicate with one another. We bury our dead. We feel that all of these things and many more give us an advantage over all other species. We're the top of the pyramid. That's what we like to think. Exactly. It's likely just our ego, right? Certainly some people feel that Bigfoot cannot be a real creature because if Bigfoot were real, we as humans would have inevitably caught some indisputable evidence of it, despite us still discovering hundreds of new species every single year and rediscovering species thought to be extinct centuries later. But still, we're like, obviously we would know if Bigfoot were real because we're perfect and amazing and the most expert of scientists and explorers. Duh. Duh. But perhaps what bothers people the most is the theory that Bigfoots are actually more capable than us. They communicate with one another. They have unimaginable strength. (laughs) The ability to live in the harshest of environments, to evade capture. They may have empathy and social structures of their own. Like Sabrina, you mentioned last week, the Bigfoot funeral. Yeah. They are said to communicate with one another through grunts, through whistles, through whispers, through the use of knocking, sticks, and screams for long-range communications. Bigfoot seem to understand the concept of reciprocity and gifts, as campers sometimes cite that if they allow these creatures safe passage or allow them to take some food, these creatures will often return the next day or later that evening with berries and fish left behind as a gift. They leave threatening warnings of stones, which would insinuate that they don't always act out of instinct, but instead rather they assess their situation and they make judgments. And according to the indigenous Chehalis tribe, these creatures also have the ability to shapeshift. That's the part that then confuses everything. It's like, what version of them is real? Totally. Well, it's a very confusing thing. And I feel like even though this episode, I put together a bunch of examples to try to convince everyone of Bigfoot's existence, I still feel like at the end, people might feel that Bigfoot is real, but we still don't necessarily know exactly what Bigfoot is because there's a lot of different theories and we will go through a bunch of them. 
But basically, if Bigfoots are shapeshifters, like the Chehalis tribe believes and a lot of other indigenous groups believe, that means that most likely these creatures have been silently watching us for potentially thousands of years. And it makes me wonder, especially with all of the depictions of like Paleolithic theories and, and sculptures from the past and all of the petroglyphs and if perhaps they used to be a lot friendlier with humans. And since we've evolved and become a little bit more destructive to the land around us and to each other, perhaps these Bigfoots were like, oop, we don't want anything to do with these people. And they recede further and further into the wilderness. As two humans, you and I, speaking as one, because we are one, who have often encountered moments in life where we're like, it's just too much. I want to go retreat into the wilderness and be away from everyone and everything. I get it. I I want to do it half the time. Oh yeah, I totally get it. And I feel like it makes a lot of sense. And also I'll be the first to admit, like but even this theory of like, oh, did, did the Bigfoots like us at one point and then they turn away from man? That's assuming that we're of interest to them to begin with. So also, this could be part of my ego talking too. Like, what if there's no interest in human beings at all? And we're just the ones obsessed with them. Interesting. If they don't care about us at all. Yeah. I mean, that is so human to be like, we are obsessed with this thing and, and they must know so much about us and every decision they make must be about us. And they literally don't even think about us. Right. Which I feel like could be more true than anything, because what do we have to offer them? Probably only aggression and death. I'm sure the few that have tried to get close maybe didn't even live to tell the tale. Aww. It's so weird because it's been now a, a week since we recorded part two. And I, I left part two being like, you know, I just I have a hard time. Like if we would I really was like we would know that they exist and we would have proof of their existence if they existed. But now I'm back and I'm like, of course they're real. It's marinated a little bit with you. <laughs> <laughs> You've started to think about Bigfoot, to dream about Bigfoot. I have been weeded. You've been the weeded. weeds have been plucked. Okay, but I also think it makes sense if they aren't interested in us too, because now that I'm thinking about it, if they are what the Chehalis people and other indigenous groups believe them to be, which is some sort of supernatural creature that walks between the two realms, right? Like it walks in the spirit world, it walks in the physical realm. That is so far beyond our ability. And who else? What other world? Yeah. in the amount of creatures that they probably encounter that are far more interesting than us, I, I think would be a plenty. So it also makes sense to me why it would be impossible to catch one if they are kind of this in-between creature and have the ability to enter many different portals or dimensions or realms, what, whatever you want to consider as where they could be going that's not physically right here that where we can see them. Just to bring up Greg and Dana again, because we're obsessed with them. I saw on Dana's Instagram, they did a psychic viewing of Area 51 this past weekend. Ooh. I know. So I was no like, way. What if that's find? possible, oh, I don't know. I, I didn't read much more, but I'm curious. We're on their that, Patreon. We should I know. look. They post a with lot that them. being a potential, like, can we then psychic view into these planes where all of these other beings, potentially Bigfoot and who who knows what else, exist yeah. and connect to them in a way that we never thought possible? Right. If we're powerful enough, I'm sure there's someone out there that's either close. But then also I feel like the people that are at that level where they're so in tune with their spirituality and so in tune with just the world beyond earth, just like the entire existence, I almost feel like they have an understanding that's like, like the way that we view things is so rudimentary compared to how they probably experience life. And so even if there are some people that do that, I almost doubt that they would tell anyone, right? Like they, they're protecting. Or if they do, are they believed, you know? Yeah. I don't know. It's so convoluted. Okay. So uh, my gosh, this isn't hard. Okay. I'm going to, after this, I'm going to just let you tell me everything because I, I just want to hear your stories and I know there's a lot of information, but I was a Barbenheimer girl this week, weekend. I saw both movies. Double feature. Oh, me and my brother just talked about doing that. No, I didn't back to back, but I did Friday and Sunday. And they're both so incredible. Oppenheimer from like a physics, like understanding the universe and how massive it is and like how we are still exploring and understanding things like and never will actually have the capacity to really understand is so mind blowing. But then in Barbie, like it's this idea of becoming yourself and existing outside of this like world that everyone wants to put you in. And who are you? What is meeting? What is life? And all of a sudden, I don't know. Anyway, I, I just what were you made for the Billie Eilish song? I haven't even seen uh, the movie, but still cry. <laughs> 
just like imagining the scene. I loved it. Oh, hi Barbie. Gosh. Hi. Hi, hi Barbie. Barbie. Hi Barbie. Bye Barbie. Bye Barbie. Every night's a girl's night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't wait to see it. I want to watch both. My brother and I were going to Vermont this week. We took like a family vacation Friday through Wednesday, right before my birthday. And we're going to go see Noah Khan. We're going to float down the Winooski River. We're going to go out on the boat. We're going to spend time outside, probably drink a ton of IPAs. And my brother and I were like, we got to do the double feature. We got to do the- You got to. It's so good. Exactly. We'll have a, maybe we'll do like a Patreon thing where we just talk about our opinions of those movies. Okay. I love that. That's a great idea. All right. So before we get too far into everything, I do want to say, so we had mentioned in the past two episodes that there are theories or there's a theory that Bigfoot is an interdimensional being. And so for this episode, I was like, oh my gosh, why don't I use Starry AI, which is an AI, uh, like picture portrait art generator. And I was like, why don't I prompt it to give me basically like an image of Bigfoot being one foot in this dimension and one foot in another, because I wanted some sort of visual for YouTube. What I got was so much more. I got a group of photos that absolutely looked like it would be on a dating profile for Bigfoot. So I created a fake dating profile for Bigfoot. I'm going to send it to you right now. Stop. Okay. It. I was cracking myself up. <laughs> so I love we're this gonna go through so it. much. <gasps> Oh my right. God. First page, Big for Bigfoot. His name is Big. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube or on, on our reels or TikTok, we'll definitely post it. But here's Big. He is 107 Wait. years old. He's hot. Which I equated to probably being like a 32 years old in human, yeah. human life. That's what I was thinking. He's interested in humans, dating humans. He's he's curious about them. Okay. Human. He's human curious. And he's eight foot one which we know means he's seven foot 10. <laughs> His job is a mountaineer. He went to Oregon State University. Look at him, little smarty pants. Uh, his religion, spiritual, he's open. Uh, and in terms of relationship, he's looking for a long-term relationship, but open to short. So if he's dating a human, he's gotta be open to short-term because he'll outlive That's you by true. hundreds of years. They will definitely, yeah. Oh my gosh, wow. This, this is very much like a dating profile because there are so many like dating profiles where like the second photo is the guy holding like a weapon or like hunting in some way yeah okay so i asked the general once i got a few pro- it was all like profile pictures and i was like that's mm-hmm. hilarious i'm going to have it give me a few more and so i prompted it to give me bigfoot uh fishing or holding you've, a fish. you've seen enough dating profiles to know what they're like 70% of them have a man holding a fish. Every My knowledge guy is wants sub- to show you secondary. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what the dating pool is like in LA, but it, in Massachusetts, everyone's holding a fish. So <laughs> <laughs> I had AI generate a picture of Bigfoot holding a fish. I can, I'll post all of the images, the full images on, on Patreon for a good laugh. Did you create this on Canva? I did. Yeah. So <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted it to look like you were scrolling through it. It's so uh, good. So yeah, Bigfoot's face is cut off for the the fish pick, but he's holding a fish. His fish he pick. answered a few prompts too. One of the prompts is my favorite way to spend a rainy day is, and he answered carving wooden feet and pressing them into the soggy earth. So perhaps he's the one behind <laughs> all of the uh, the faked Bigfoot impressions. I'm reading ahead. I'm just so excited. This is my favorite song. <laughs> The next image, I tried to prompt it to say Bigfoot playing a sport because there's always someone hanging off of a cliff and mountain biking or running and being like, well, I need a girl who can keep up, you know? So I, I tried to do that. For some reason, AI gave me Bigfoot doing a heel click, which I thought was <laughs> equally fantastic. <laughs> so that made it into the dating profile. Stop. His go-to karaoke song is The Sound of Silence by Simon and Garfunkel. Favorite song? Hello, darkness, my old old friend. friend. I've come to talk to you again. And I felt like it was very fitting for this really emotional photo of Bigfoot walking down a path in the middle of the woods. In the darkness. Which is the fourth photo on his dating profile. He then answers the prompt, the most embarrassing thing that has happened to me is, he writes, a hiker caught me walking naked through the woods and posted the video on YouTube. Winky face. (laughs) And I did the winky face because as much as I love Bigfoot, I also have to recognize that he likely 
has a little douchiness to him. And mm. so I thought the winky face is, you know, like a, ooh, you want to see me naked? Go go Google it. Go, I think I'm, I'm hot as shit. Yeah. So I had to put he that knows. in. Another thing that is often on human males dating profiles is a photo of them with another girl. It might be their mom, it might be their sister, it might be their friend. But when that happens, you have the ability, at least on Hinge when I was on it years ago, you have the ability to basically caption the photo. And I noticed that a lot of men said who was in the photo with them so that you wouldn't assume it was a girlfriend. And so gotcha. the next photo is Bigfoot. It's the only photo he's captioned and it says me and my niece. And and there's a She kind of looks like girl. me. She does look like you. <laughs> I was like, did you do this on purpose? No, she actually does look a lot like you, though. That's funny. (laughs) And then uh, he answered, my most used app is Merlin ID, because he's got to ID all the birds that he lives around him. But Google translates a close second. You know, got to catch up with the humans, know what they're talking about. And then the final photo is was a shirtless pic, so I, I cropped it so we didn't see any nipple, PG. even though we, we have him fully nude doing a heel click on here. But yeah, that's, that's his amazing. dating profile. I would swipe right. I got up at 6 a.m. to finish his dating profile. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I gotta finish this at like 10 o'clock last night. I was like, I'm going to bed, but I'm waking up early because I gotta finish dating this. profile. <laughs> oh my gosh. I told Brian, I was like, just to warn you, I'm going to re-download Hinge. And he like looked at me and I was like, I got to create a Bigfoot profile picture or like a Hinge profile. He was like, okay. And I was like, well, I can just do this on camp. I guess I don't have to actually Reactivate fully join your and, and potentially like catfish other people as Bigfoot. So <laughs> I would honestly, if I came across that on a dating app, I would just swipe right only for the sake of, I just need to know who created this. <laughs> I thought it was real good. I had so much fun doing it. I love it. it. It's so good. I answered a thousand more prompts, but I, I had to pick and choose some. Well, you can add, maybe you can put some of the, the other ones that you did on our Patreon. Yeah. Well, honestly, I feel like we should almost do like an open answer where people will give the prompt and people can give Bigfoot's response, what they think oh, he would say. that's a good idea. We're all Bigfoot. That's We're all Bigfoot. All of us are Bigfoot. We all believe. I just want to okay. say my stomach is making so many noises. I thought that was Leia. No, it's my stomach. So if you hear like that, it's it's no longer wow. layered. It's my stomach. Oh my gosh, it's the ramen or pad thai. What did you this? have? I Head do ramen. hear it. Hold on. I don't even think you need to put the microphone near it. It just did it. It did. <laughs> okay. All right. Bigfoot. Okay. We're dating him. So, yeah, I just spent 15 minutes going through his dating profile, despite how long this episode already is going to be. So let's get into it. We're going to look at some theories about what Bigfoot is. The first being an interdimensional traveler. It has been suggested that the reason why we're never able to catch or capture Bigfoot is because these creatures can teleport or slip in and out of our reality. They exist across multiple dimensions and are able to completely jump in and out of our timeline willy-nilly whenever they want, and even partially exist within ours, which isn't dissimilar to the beliefs that the Chehalis tribe mentioned, or, or they meant they believe and I mentioned in episode one of this Bigfoot series or part one. And it's a very interesting theory because people who have spotted Bigfoot tracks often remark that these tracks stop suddenly as if the creature has suddenly vanished without a trace. So potentially slipped into a portal. Which is a great like escape technique. Oh my God, totally. And safety mechanism. Absolutely. Yeah, it is really interesting. And I I feel like that's makes a lot I mean it makes a lot of sense and I'm about to tell you (laughs) some of the reasons why okay so I find the ability of Bigfoot to kind of pop into different dimensions super interesting because if anyone here is familiar with David Politis the founder of Missing 411 who we've mentioned probably 30 times on this podcast in many of the mysterious disappearances that he covers especially with children the common thread is that they seem to disappear without a trace and often there are footprints of these people and of the children that stop suddenly with no indication that they've taken another step further from that very spot, which some people were like, oh my gosh, this is an alien abduction. But also, could this be Bigfoot? A curious and mysterious disappearance is that of Jim Carter, which people now theorize could have been due to him being chased by a Bigfoot. Jim Carter, age 32, 
was part of a 20-member climbing party from Seattle who visited Mount St. Helens in Washington in May of 1950. Jim was a very experienced skier and mountaineer, so no one was really worried when Jim was like, oh, you know what? This is going to be a really great photo op because the the group was about to get to this landmark called Dog's Head. It's about 8,000 feet in elevation. So he was like, everyone, you guys keep skiing. I'm going to like zip down, ski ahead, kind of loop around and turn so I can take a picture of all of you guys up at this landmark as you're coming down. So the rest of the group is like, great, great, like awesome. He takes off, they take a moment and then they start to follow so that Jim can capture a photo of them. The rest of the group finally caught up to the area where Jim had planned to wait for them and snap a pic, but there was no Jim. There was a discarded film box at the spot where he had originally planned to stop to take the photo of the group, which indicated that he had stopped and he was in the middle of preparing for a photo, but something happened to trigger Jim Carter to flee. While there was evidence of Jim's attempted descent, Jim was nowhere to be found and a very, very large area was searched, an expansive area with very experienced search and rescue teams. They looked for weeks, but nobody found Jim. And nothing. Nothing. But what they did find were tracks of his skis. So we know where he went ish. So what Jim saw, we do not know, but it would appear that he moved very suddenly from the spot where he had dropped his film box. He took off maneuvering down the mountain on a route that no skier of his caliber, which was a really excellent skier, would ever do unless something terribly wrong was occurring. Like you had to. Yeah. Yes. He jumped over two to three large crevasses and he was going down the slope of the mountain at a death defying speed. It was as if something was chasing him and he had to get away. His ski tracks were traced going over the steep side of Ape Canyon and straight down the canyon walls, which surely most people would never attempt because it basically is like, you're going to die if you do that. But he did it. And they were shocked when his body wasn't at the bottom. He didn't die doing this. Instead, the ski tracks continued. So he survived that crazy ski maneuver. His adrenaline must have been pumping like no other. Then there was a plane that was taken overhead to try to trace where his tracks went next. The plane tracked his trail from the sky, finding ski marks heading towards the Eagle Creek Ranger Station and then disappearing into the wilderness. And then they couldn't find any more tracks. Okay, the hard thing with this, I'm just gonna be, I'm not even a skeptic, I'm just going to talk through what my brain goes with logic. In a ski, snowy mountain region, it's very possible tracks could be covered up with snow, with new, like fallen snow, especially if it's into the wilderness, there's tree fall, you know, who knows. But then also, like if he went down this really, really steep cascading slope and there were a ton of crevasses that he did successfully jump over, is there a potential that his skis continued on, but his body did not? Oh, maybe. But... That area is frequented enough that, I mean, it's 50 some years later or not even, it's like 75 years later after That's this true. has happened. And so if it were, if he, his body did die, like if he fell to his death, he, it was so close to a ranger station and in a spot where people go hiking and rock climbing and skiing that when the snow melted, he would have been recovered. Unless he was in a deep crevasse. Unless he fell into another crevasse. That's true. And it is interesting because it's like, well, what was he running from? There's a possibility that it was a bear. But at the same time, because he was such an experienced skier, you would think that he would have probably stuck on the trail and just out skied the bear, right? Like if you're going down the slope fast enough, which he was going at a death defying speed, even a non death defying speed would still out, out maneuver a bear. And he was going off of cliffs. So you would think that even if he did go off of this cliff, he wouldn't have to necessarily keep going. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what adrenaline and fear and stuff will do to someone, but there were so many moves that he made that if he were being chased by a bear, he wouldn't have to continue further because a bear would have never made those leaps. It would have never caught up to him. Anyway, he was not at the bottom and his skis disappeared into the woods. Bob Lee, a member of the Seattle Mountain Search and Rescue Unit who was also involved in the search for Jim Carter, he was a very experienced Portland mountaineer and he was a part of the exclusive worldwide Alpine Club, leader and advisor to various expeditions, including a Himalayan expedition. So by all accounts, Bob Lee, super pro, expert on the mountain. He knows his shit. And so this is normally a place that he would feel comfortable in. 
but he said during his search for Jim, he felt like, quote, somebody was watching me and there was something strange on the high slopes of the mountain. The most eerie experience I have ever had. I could feel the hair on my neck standing up. It was eerie. I was unarmed except for my ice axe. And believe me, I never let go of that. See, that's the thing is like, it's so animalistic, that feeling. Right? Like you, your body knows when you're prey. Yeah. You know when there's a predator near. That's wild. Yeah. This is also the same location or Ape Canyon is the same location where from 1924 to 1926, miners had various encounters with quote unquote ape men who were covered in long black hair, had ears about four inches long that stuck straight up, had four toes, short and stubby. And these ape men were about 400 pounds. And one night, these eight men violently attacked the group of men. So the creatures were near the cabin looking down at them from a ridge above. And Fred Beck, who was one of the uh, people, one of the miners staying here, he and another miner went out and shot his rifle up at them, struck one of the creatures three times, and the animal then fell off of the cliff. That night, the creatures return, throwing huge stones at the cabin, slamming their large bodies against the door and the walls of this little log cabin that all the miners are terrified, cowering within. Then these creatures jump up on the cabin. They're ripping the roof off. And finally, they have an opening. They spot Fred because they recognize him as the one that shot the, one of their own and drop rocks on him until he falls unconscious. They presumably believe him to be dead. Fred wakes up two hours later, and the moment the sun rose, the group took off. They abandoned their cabin. They ran for their lives. Similar to other encounters, many people didn't believe this group of miners, citing that they must have made it up for fame, that they faked the large 14-inch footprints that were found nearby, and that the at attack was exaggerated. Reports came out after stating that they must have just been confused and it was wrong place, wrong time, because at the time there were some YMCA campers who apparently were staying there and were up on the ridge and they were throwing pumice rocks down into the canyon that night in some sort of like cer ceremonial thing that they do every year, not realizing that there was a cabin below. So people were like, it must have been the YMCA campers throwing pumice stones. These guys got confused, their imaginations ran, and no. they made up the rest of the story. I doubt that. Right? So these men, they've stuck to their story. They say the things that they've said happened were 100% true, but the media exaggerated certain parts of the story. So they said the roof was not compromised. Fred was not knocked unconscious, but everything else was true. Them shooting a creature, the creatures coming and attacking the outside of the cabin, slamming their bodies against it. But other than that, the other stuff was exaggerated, but that's still a very aggressive and scary encounter to have. So could a Bigfoot be responsible for these missing people and for the attacks? Maybe. One thing that stands out to me is going back to missing 411, there are many bizarre cases of children disappearing and then being found sometime later. And often they're found in areas that are impossible for the child to traverse alone in the amount of time that they're missing or at all. So sometimes these kids will disappear and then they'll show up 15 miles away, 5,000 feet in elevation. What do they say when they're found? Well, I'll tell you in a second. Okay. I've got a few examples. Okay. So when these kids are found, oftentimes their clothes are in pristine condition. Their feet are still clean. They lack any bumps or bruises, which surely wouldn't be true if a child had walked that many miles through streams and mountains to get to the spot where they're found. And some of these kids speak of the hairy man or the bear or quote, big hairy wolf man that kept them company or carried them to that spot. So I have a few examples of this. In 1888, the New York Times reported on the disappearance of a two-year-old girl who was found alive a day later, deep in a valley where she claimed a bear had slept with her throughout the night to keep her warm. <gasps> Wait, this is so sweet. I know. A similar tale emerged from two-year-old Ida May Curtis, who went missing in Kootenai National Forest in Montana in 1955. After two days of pouring rain, she was located, and she too said she was cuddled by a bear and comforted. In 2010, three-year-old Rowan Griffin went missing in New Hampshire. So this is, this is so recent. This is only 13 years ago, and it's in New Hampshire, right here by me. Rowan Griffin went missing in New Hampshire during a family outing in the woods. 11 hours later, he was found clinging to a tree in a swamp with the water about waist deep, 
And when he was asked how he got there, he said that there was a man he had seen peeking out from behind a tree. And so he followed this man. And apparently, I don't know if this man was different than this figure he spoke about, but Rowan said that there was this giant figure in the woods that protected him while he was in the woods and in the swamp. It's so interesting how with young kids, it feels like these are protective beings. But when it comes to adults, they often don't come back alive. Or at all. They're fully missing. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we don't know if they're dead or alive. We have no idea. In 2019, a three-year-old boy, Casey Hathaway, had gone missing after vanishing from outside of his grandmother's house in North Carolina one afternoon. In the two days he was missing, there was really heavy rain, freezing temperatures. So surely it would have had to be a miracle for this boy to survive being in the wilderness at this young age throughout this horrible weather period. FBI and U.S. Marine search teams were scouring the area for this toddler, and then a neighbor found him. She said she heard cries coming from 40 yards away while she was out walking her dog. And so she followed the noises and she found Casey tangled in thorn bushes, but was otherwise unharmed. Once he was at the hospital, he told his family that a bear had stayed with him and kept him safe and warm. This is amazing. Yes. Right? So they're, they're like snuggled. They're snuggled. They're protected. They're some Something is staying with them up until basically the point where someone's near to to save them and so it seems awfully su suspicious that a bear would protect a child but perhaps it could because right we see these we see these videos online and on animal planet and whatever where there's like a female lioness who kills this antelope and then realize there's a baby antelope and, and protects it and keeps it safe you know not always but sometimes there are paternal instincts that kick in but what i thought was odd was if an animal like a bear has all of these children throughout the past many, many decades that they encounter and decide this is a, a weak being and my paternal and maternal, my parental instincts have kicked in. I shall protect it. So I think that that's odd. I also think it's odd that there's no evidence given that these bears are spending so much time with these children and cuddled up to them. You would think that there'd be more evidence right there where the child's found. And lastly, if there's an animal that has decided to protect this small child, don't you think the animal would still be there when this kid is found and not just silently disappeared the moment that a human finally recovers the child? Yeah. Maybe it's a bear, but, but I don't really think so. I don't think so either. Yeah. But for those who don't believe in Bigfoot, perhaps that's that's an explanation they can accept. I mean, that is super bizarre. If it's a bear, it's also super bizarre. And then it makes me question how people aren't then being like, okay, well, we clearly don't know everything about bears. We need to learn more about bears. Right. Yeah. I wonder what bearologists, <laughs> I don't know what they're Bearologists. Called. I wonder what bearologists have to, have to say word. about this. Some people are like, this is a case of mistaken identity. All the Bigfoot sightings out there. They must be bear. We have all these kids saying that they're protected by bears and there's these tall furry creatures. It's gotta be a bear. American black bears, well, bears do stand on their hind legs sometimes, especially when they're foresting for like berries and various things. American black bears could kind of look like Bigfoot standing on two feet, hidden amongst the dense foliage. On their hind legs, the American black bear stands about five to seven feet tall. So not quite tall enough but not, not too small compared to the, the smallest Bigfoot sightings. Right, seven feet is tall. Yes, grizzly bears stand about eight to nine feet tall. So this would be within Bigfoot's range. And perhaps it could be an explanation for a few of the sightings. After all, uh, I read this really interesting fact that when Westerners were first exploring China 200 years ago, they were shocked to see a large black and white furry beast living in the bamboo forest, which, is a panda bear but even Aww. so that's an example of of new people to the area being shocked by a creature but it's the indigenous people there the the people living in china they knew what, what this thing was they weren't like oh my gosh a random beast we've never seen it was just the europeans <laughs> so. yes and then and then since then we have we fully understand pandas now you know that's yeah. the thing that's different about Bigfoot and these entities that people mm -hmm. are encountering is it is a shock. Oh my gosh, what is this? And then we can't further investigate. Like it's just, we, we hit a wall. Yeah, we do. <sighs> There's so many theories. Like, I don't even know what Bigfoot is either. Like I I'm completely convinced of Bigfoot, but I just don't know what it is. Yeah. 
But bears, I do not think it is, especially because, well, for many, many reasons, but also the tracks that are left behind do not look like bear prints at all. They're completely different. And also their movement is completely different. So all of the footage that captures Bigfoot walking and the, the descriptions of Bigfoot walking and running, it's so completely different from a bear. Yeah. But you know what does move like Bigfoot when Bigfoot's walking? Apes. Hmm. So I'm going to show you a video. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can see it here. Or sorry, not a video. It's a still, a photo still of a gorilla walking and... There's two photos of this gorilla walking, and in the middle is the picture or a still uh, of the Bigfoot captured on the Patterson-Gimlin film, which, Sabrina, you talked about in part two. Okay, I want to see. I just sent you the photo. So it's interesting because you can see, like, obviously there's there's things that aren't similar, right? Like, there's plenty that distinguishes Bigfoot from being an ape, but the body is similar. The hair... The way that the hair kind of is like tufted in the shape of the head is almost cone-like. That's similar. The definition of the back and the glute muscles and kind of like where the glutes land mid-back, the length of the arms, even the pad of the foot. The pad of the foot is a different color, but it's still this pad that doesn't have an arch or anything. It's interesting putting these side by side because, I mean, it's hard now knowing like the, I guess... To be fair, it has not been proven that that film is fake, Mm -hmm. but it has not been proven to be true either. But seeing them side by side, yes, there's a very similar gait and like the way that their arms extend. But the Bigfoot in the middle here has almost like a slouched posture, like very human-like. Yeah, and the knees, instead of going outwards, go forward like a human. It's like an ape and human hybrid. Weird. Yeah. I feel like just like at some point evolution... Okay, here's my weird wonky throwing it out there, seeing if the pasta hits sticks on the wall theory. What if, if we believe in multiple timelines, dimensions, and like when glitches happen, some people like, you know, or even the Mandela effect. If you think about how like randomly things like switch and we enter a different timeline. What if throughout the years of evolution, there is one dimension in which we evolved differently? Ooh, Ooh, I like this theory, Sabrina. And we are still as intellectual as we have become and developed, but we've maintained the hairiness, the bigness. Hygiene is not as important. No. And there's something else too, where it's like we, our language isn't quite as complex or it's it's just not something that we in this timeline and dimension can understand as the human beings we have developed into. But we can't, to my knowledge, we can't, all as a collective species jump to different timelines and portals and travel interdimensionally like Bigfoot supposedly do. But I like this theory. I think you're onto something. And I think that this is almost a culmination of some of the theories I'm about to present to you. Okay. So some theorize that Bigfoots could be a group of great escaped apes. Many apes have escaped zoos in the past and escaped their private owners over the years, which is so interesting because there is evidence of these now wild, small populations of various apes that live like in swamps and places in like Florida and the Carolinas that have escaped from traveling circuses and zoos and all of these things. And so I think that that is an interesting theory, but I don't think it accounts for the aggression, the tree ripping, the hollering, the echoes through the woods, and the fact that these beasts are all over the place and easily evade humans. I think if you saw a monkey in one location, you'd be able to go back to that location and probably find it. Or something similar. Totally. Like they would live in, it's not like that it randomly happened upon in that area. Like it would exist there. Right. And also I feel like some of these Bigfoot sightings, yeah, they're in, in the wilderness, but it's not like we're going through the Amazon rainforest and it's like a terrible place to trek through because it's so dense and you easily get lost like some of these woods are spacious and yeah they're large but it's not it's not impossible to traverse by any means so some people theorize it's great apes but there are definite differences between gorillas and other apes and a bigfoot their size their color their stench the apes footprints don't just disappear either because they are always within this plane so they don't just randomly escape leaving a footprint behind in the soil and also they utilize their hands and their fists to move so if 
if we watched a Bigfoot run and it had used its long arms to just kind of hoo, 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 move down on the ground on all fours, then perhaps I'd entertain that idea a little bit more. But but they don't. Yeah, it's much more human-like in its movement. Some people have theorized that these sightings are not of an undiscovered creature, but actually of one thought to be long dead. Around 10 to 12 million years ago, there was a giant ape called Gigantopithecus black eye, which shared a common ancestor with the modern orangutan. This creature was so enormous that it was the largest primate that ever lived in Asia. It weighed about 440 to 600 pounds and it was 9.8 feet tall. And somehow it is it has outlived all of those years and wound up in Washington in the woods of Portland and in the woods of uh Northern California. Look at you, Sabrina. But it's never to be found. <laughs> you went from skeptic to full on believer. <laughs> now you're like, okay, gigantic brick at this black eye. Sure. Here's the thing as a middle child and as a child of divorce who has very much been the um, emotional support for parents, I like to see things from both sides. <laughs> And so today we get the believer side of you. <laughs> okay, well, so people are theorizing. So apparently versions of this creature, basically like ancestors of this creature, existed up until 11,000 years ago in southern China. And so this was certainly during the time of Homo erectus period of human evolution. And so people wonder if perhaps these creatures still exist and maybe they migrated through Asia and Europe. Maybe during the Ice Age, they migrated over the, the Bering Strait thousands and thousands of years ago into North America undetected. Or maybe they crossbred with our ancestors all the way back in the day, similar to how Neanderthals did. And the small population has evolved into what we now believe to be Bigfoot. Corinne, it sounds like you weren't the first one to want Bigfoot as your boyfriend. Apparently not. Actually, I was looking at photos of just like human evolution and it made me want to throw up. I was like, this is, we looked so gross. Yeah. <laughs> we still do if you think about it. Like we do, but it was weird. It's like we had like monkey tops and, and strong human thighs. It was like our legs were human and our tops were monkey and I didn't like looking at it. We're, we were hybrid creatures. That, yeah. Okay, uh, conversations like this is what makes me laugh so much about like beauty standards and idealized bodies and body image because we are literally mon like we're, we're monkeys. We're creatures. We're, mon we're naked mole rats of monkeys. We're, we're just, yeah, like we've, I don't know, it just blows my mind anyway. We're the, what's the cat that's the hair, the hairless cat? We're the hairless cats of, of gorillas. Anyway, we're bald and wrinkly and gross. Ugh. And we flake. We flake. Ugh. Skin cells could not be grosser. And the fact that we slather like lotion and stuff onto our like open organs, I'm done. <laughs> Turn me into fairy dust. That's all I am comfortable being. Okay. So humans are gross. <laughs> <laughs> Bigfoot's debatably grosser. Uh, another theory is that Bigfoot, Bigfoot's, are actually a small group of surviving Neanderthals in a joint project between Oxford University and Lausanne Museum of Zoology. Scientists and researchers are going through an archive of supposed Bigfoot slash Yeti remains collected by Bernard Huvelmans, who investigated reported Yeti sightings between 1950 until his death in 2001. So he has a ton of materials that people have submitted to him or that he's collected over time that supposedly are evidence for Bigfoot and Yeti. And these reputable groups are now taking samples and putting them through rigorous genetic analysis to determine if there are any unknown species. So far, they've only gotten back human samples and, and basically animals that we already know, but they haven't gone through all of the DNA yet. Uh, and they have also said part of the reason that they're doing this is because recent advancements of DNA analysis have led to our discovery that Homo sapiens and Neanderthals had considerable interbreeding, which is something we didn't know. So if you have like Ancestry.com or 23andMe, you'll probably get a percentage of how Neanderthal you are, which a hundred years ago, no one knew anything about us do you know how much Neanderthal you are? I'll tell you right now. Let's log into our 23andMe's. Let's okay. report. I was pretty low. I was proud of myself. Oh, I think I'm pretty Neanderthal. Proud of myself. I did nothing. <laughs> proud of your ancestors for... Yeah. I have less than 2% Neanderthal DNA. 
That's you so inherited good. a small amount of DNA from your Neanderthal ancestors. Out of the 7,462 variants we tested, we found 226 variants in your DNA that trace back to the Neanderthals, which accounts for less than 2% of your DNA. Okay, let me go to mine. My cousin, though, she has more Neanderthal in me, in, in her than in me. I'm in second place compared to my friends and family. Wow, look at you. Sorry, Monique. Okay, I also have less than 2%. What was your, when it says how much Neanderthal DNA you have compared to other customers, what did it say? It says you have more Neanderthal DNA than 29% of customers. I have more Neanderthal DNA than 66% of customers. <laughs> <laughs> well, my cousin has more than 82%, so. Yeah, that's wild. Oh my gosh, we're all just a little monkey here. We wouldn't be us without them, so. Yeah, they're prehistoric humans that bred with other prehistoric humans. Just various offshoots. We're all a jump, jumbled version of human here, right? Yeah. Okay. So they're hypothesizing that perhaps yetis are Neanderthal descendants. Other species like Homo erectus, Paranthropus robustus, and Homo heidelbergensis. <laughs> I don't, uh, I did not follow at all. <laughs> no, no. Nope. It doesn't matter. Why did I write that? I couldn't, I knew I couldn't <laughs> say it. Okay, but put all those variations of human ancestors, uh, variations of, of who we were before we became Homo sapiens, are theorized to also potentially be some version of Bigfoot. And this is not so outlandish because even our favorite primatologist, Jane Goodall, is entertaining the idea of Bigfoot. One time, she was visiting a remote village in Ecuador and she asked the locals if they'd ever seen a monkey without a tail. Three of the hunters came back and said, oh yes, we've seen monkeys without tails. They walk upright and they are about six foot tall. Jane Goodall said, quote, I'm a romantic, so I always wanted them to exist. You know, why isn't there a body? I can't answer that, and maybe they don't exist, but I want them to. And then she also suggested that it's very possible that this is a species far more intelligent than we possibly imagined, and perhaps they're burying their bodies in a way that we cannot find their bodies, so in some ceremonial thing. And she also uh, theorized that perhaps these are Neanderthal relatives. So she too thinks that that's a possibility and is totally open to the idea of Bigfoot existing. See, that's the thing. Here, here's my, my biggest, even when I'm skeptical, I am open to all possibilities. And I think if anything that I have learned in this life, in my near 30 years of life, is that nothing is as I expected or understood it to be. And every thought I've had can be challenged. Right. Well, and I feel like that just, that's a good way to think of things. Imagine if we lived 300 years ago, the beliefs that people had 300 years ago in our understanding of medicine and science and the world around us was so far off from where we are now. And so to think that we have all of the knowledge to be able to make the decision and, and make the assertion that this is certainly unable to be true. There's, it, there's no possibility of this existence. That's ludicrous because, you know, in another 300 years or in a thousand years, people might look back on that, on this belief and be like, oh, they thought it was witchcraft or, you know, like it's the typical, we think we know all that we possibly can in the moment that we live. And there might be so much more that we are barely even scratching the surface, but it feels like we're so big and important and on the cusp of all the knowledge to be had. It's the, the human ego, right? It is And ego. curiosity. We're curious, but not so curious that we'll admit that we don't know much. We know a lot, but not much, right? I'll admit that I'm dumb. And I, I you know what? And I'm glad to be dumb because that means that I have a lot to live for and to learn and to know. If I knew everything, well, then what's the point? And we'll, here's the thing, we'll never know everything. It's just fun to live. Until I die and I get all the answers because that's obviously what happens. Maybe you'll be reincarnated in 4,000 years and be like the most excellent scientist researcher. Maybe you're the one that figures out how to time travel. I really hope so. Yeah. Well, we'll see. Okay. Some other theories are that Bigfoot are simply human beings dressed up to fool others or simply human beings going about their day on their hike, on their hunt, living nomadically off grid in the woods and people 
uh, seeing them exist and thinking that they're Bigfoot and mistaking them as a Bigfoot sighting. There have been numerous cases of people being shot and killed by other people who mistook them for a Bigfoot. Even a shaman, well, the shaman didn't get murdered. But let me just tell you that now. The shaman, uh, there was a shaman in North Carolina a few years ago who was there on vacation and was wearing an outfit of animal furs. And him vacationing there led to an uptick of Bigfoot sightings being reported because people believed when they saw him that they were witnessing Bigfoot because he was wearing all these furs. So people want to see Bigfoot, right? Like we want to see things that we believe in. We want to be convinced of something's existence, which is why some of these Bigfoot sightings may not be anything at all. Maybe they're not Bigfoot, maybe they're not anything. Instead, they're a case of pareidolia, which is the human tendency to observe human-like faces and figures in our natural environment. So we see Jesus on a potato chip and we sometimes see Bigfoot in the trees. And Mary cry. And we see Mary cry, exactly, yes. But there's another theory about why Bigfoot has yet to be detected and why they appear to live all across North America, Asia, and even Europe, sometimes Australia. And that theory is that Bigfoots utilize an underground network of caves to live in, to travel long distances, and to avoid detection from humans. Okay, so I'm sure people have heard of or seen this map before, but in North America, we have a vast network of unexplored caves. And this map that I'm showing- This is a fun map. On YouTube. Yes. Scary. The map on the top shows missing persons. It's not missing persons in national parks. It's just missing persons. And below it shows a map of cave entrances in North America, which there's a ton of overlap. So- is it possible that people are entering caves and just getting lost and, and dying there? Or is something taking them to the caves? Is this what potentially happened to Jim Carter? So it does beg the, beg the question, are people getting kidnapped by Bigfoots? And the answer could be yes. And we do have a survivor account to suggest that this is true. Oh, okay, tell me. Albert Ostman claimed to be abducted by Bigfoot. In 1924, Albert, a lumberman, was camping on the coast of British Columbia, opposite of Vancouver Island. For three mornings in a row, while he was camping there, he awoke, exited his tent, and things were misplaced. Things were moved around. Things were being rummaged through. And so it seemed like while he was sleeping at his campsite, something came in. It wasn't quite as dramatic as being a bear, so he wasn't really sure what it was. But on the fourth night, he went to bed with all of his clothes on, getting into his sleeping bag. He had his knapsack in his sleeping bag. He had everything prepared to spring into action when he heard this animal or person who, or whoever it was going through his campsite. He's in his sleeping bag and hours are ticking by and he's trying so hard to stay awake, but he can't. And his eyes flutter and they close and finally he falls asleep. But then he wakes up. Not because he heard a noise, but because his body was being physically lifted into the air, sleeping bag and all. He, in his sleeping bag, is tossed over the shoulder of something and said that it felt like he was being tossed on horseback, being held by some sort of upright creature. After a long while, he estimated three hours, he was dumped onto the ground roughly and cautiously emerged from his sleeping bag. Albert was then looking at the faces of four hairy ape-like creatures, two male and two female, appearing to be a family, one of them eight feet tall. For six days, these large hairy creatures kept Albert captive, seemingly amused by him, interested in him, just curious about the guy. Okay. They fed him sweet tasting grass. They rummaged through his knapsack, which he had in his sleeping bag, and also in his knapsack, he had his gun, but Albert never used his gun on these creatures because he said, while he was still terrified of them, that they weren't causing him any harm. And I'm sure he was kind of curious about them as well. Uh, and they were feeding him. And he said that it appeared that the mother was trying to take care of him as well because she was washing and stacking leaves, which I assume was for making a bed. It wasn't really said, but apparently she was washing leaves and like drying them and, and stacking them together. So perhaps she was making some sort of nest for him. He noted that the Bigfoots appeared to have a language, which they How spoke many with were one there? another. 
four. There were two male and two female, and one male and one female appeared to be older and more mature, so he thought it was a mom and dad and a daughter and son. Okay. He said that there was some language-like behavior, and Albert thought the adult male was encouraging him to stay within the group and kept saying something like, sucka, sucka. Another Bigfoot offered him water and said, ook. So every time he was given water, it was like, ook, ook. Which could mean water or drink. Yeah, right? So there's some, sucka, sucka, ook. There's something, some sort of language here with rudimentary like noises. Finally, one morning, Albert was able to escape when the family of Bigfoots grabbed his snuff box, which was a box filled with tobacco and scented oils. And he had this box in his knapsack and the Bigfoots had been going through his belongings and kind of like entertained by his, his items and Albert. And they were smelling this thing and, and going through it. And then they ate it, or at least one of them did, swallowed the contents and then grew violently ill from taking in all of these tobacco and scented oil and was probably like throwing up or something. And so the Bigfoots are panicking. They're confused. They're panicked. One of them, at least one of them, if not all of them are sick from taking in this material. And Albert used this moment of confusion and chaos to sprint into the woods and eventually made it back to civilization. So they did not follow him. He sat on this story for over two decades, only telling those closest to him for fear of being criticized, which he was when he finally spoke more publicly about what he experienced. Yeah, because it does sound, you know, for a we I believe, but I understand why a lot of people wouldn't. And if you're stuck in a cave by yourself, it would probably be very easy to, I don't know, hallucinate or there's you there's no other witnesses. So you are right. Not a reliable narrator to the outside world. And, yeah. And it's hard because it's like, especially in the 70s, there was almost this uptick in Bigfoot sightings. And so, so many of them weren't real. And like you were talking about last episode, there were so many hoaxes. So it doesn't serve the people that actually do experience things like this because they're just thought of as being attention seekers. So poor Albert. You know what's so wild is that I feel like, for the most part, people who are coming out with these types of stories are so far from attention seekers that the people who are calling them attention seekers are probably the attention seekers and are jealous. Yeah, they're, they're sad they didn't come up with a tale as enticing as what these people truly experienced. And Albert swears he was kidnapped by these, by these Bigfoots, and it was terrifying. One more theory is that Bigfoots are actually an endangered species from a dying alien planet brought to Earth by more advanced aliens to ensure their survival. Bigfoots live in secret locations with advanced alien technology, or at least are being looked over by these aliens. And we only see them when they stray away from their base, which makes me think of that one encounter that you read of Kin, was it Kin? Who spoke about basically like meditating or, or was it Kin who was like on the spaceship that's Ken, and, yeah. Yeah, the and being abduction. shown all the creatures. Yeah. 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 And it made me think of that. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, if, even if Bigfoots are just animals, it would also make sense why we think that they have all of these magical abilities if they're being basically assisted by a f in these intelligent beings so far beyond our capabilities. So, like, maybe they are more ape like and maybe they're not as advanced as us or they're the same or maybe they are but maybe they're in terms of like traveling and portals and stuff maybe they're kind of almost like pets where like aliens keep them and then one strays away and then they're like oh our our guy's about to get captured and then they just kind of like blip them back into where they're supposed to be interesting it that one by far is the is to me the wildest <laughs> theory I just want to know where they go. Like, I want to hold on as they blip. Mm -hmm. Because that means there's this whole other world of Bigfoots just walking around. Who knows? What else is there? What What's going on? There's yeah. just so much we don't know. <gasps> there's so much we don't know. This is also inspiring, like, such a creative streak in me right now that I just want to, because we have no ability to, like, actually physically explore it, I want to internally mentally explore it. Like, I, I'm picturing this world and I want to sit and write it like I want to write that world the, the Bigfoot world yeah or the, wherever Bigfoots go yeah I want I'm gonna I'm gonna write some fanfic write me into that fanfic please yeah 
Yeah. Okay, well, there's another theory about Bigfoots. It's in the same vein as them being interdimensional beings, slash shapeshifters, slash spirit entities, some of the things that we've talked about earlier in this episode. Um, but it's the theory that Bigfoot can cloak itself and become entirely undetectable, aside from perhaps being detected on infrared camera. So a Bigfoot will be visible, it will leave imprints in the ground as it walks, and then in a form of camouflage, it becomes entirely invisible and its prints undetectable. There have been many people, hikers mostly, who have reported being chased by something that they could only hear, something so close to them, basically breathing down their necks, but they could see nothing with their naked eye. Oh, oh, oh. They have invisibility cloaks? They have invisibility cloaks. And you know what? This reminds me of this book that is very interesting, but definitely not like PC or with the times at all. So I'll give that warning, uh, but it's called Out on Foot. And it's these tales that this author wrote from his time working in Southern California and spending a lot of time um, in the desert. And there was a story in this book that I read years ago about someone being warned by like a feather, a fellow person that was like looking through binoculars or like on a scope or some, some infrared technology, seeing this body like heat map of this giant creature, like nine foot tall creature looming over someone else, like approaching one of their soldiers or employees or, or somebody. And that person was getting radioed and they were like, watch out, there's something coming for you. And they're looking around and they're like, there's literally nothing here. One person could see this giant monster and the person that was physically there couldn't see a single thing. But then that makes me wonder, like, does that have to do with the person who was able to see or does that have to do with the ability that this entity has only being able to cloak itself from the person it's closest to? Hmm, that's interesting. I don't know. And you know what's weird too is like, if, if the temperature, if it shows up on a heat map, it's interesting that it doesn't also leave footprints still because the thing about it being invisible is that it's invisible in all detectable ways except for the temperature so if it was still there it's odd that you could detect it in certain ways but it's completely invisible and then a 800 pound beast is not leaving any footprints all of any footprints. it's like it's floating it's, it's light strange. on its feet it's light on its feet a big foot can fly Bigfoot. apparently now too <laughs> so <laughs> Okay, so if it does have some sort of ability to cloak itself, to become invisible, surely this would help Bigfoot get from one place to the next undetected. And one such place we have mentioned before on episode 128, the Yucca Man. And as part of that, we discussed the Edwards Air Force Base in Lancaster, California. So I'm going to repeat some of the things we said in that episode because it's applicable to this one. So Edwards Air Force Base uh, in the U.S., it is a very famous Air Force base, and apparently they do a lot of top secret things there when it comes to air space, but also extraterrestrials. Of course. That's part of the airspace. Uh-huh. Yeah. They, they love aliens there. So it's interesting that despite loving aliens and kind of being focused supposedly more on that, they get these land creatures called Bigfoot. So researcher Doug Trapp, he collected these stories from various military security officers stationed at Edwards Air Force Base. And the things said from these officers suggest that at this Air Force Base, there is clearly a consensus that Bigfoot is real and the Bigfoots frequent this base. A lieutenant in charge of security in the sector of Edwards Air Force Base near Rogers Dry Lake was primarily responsible for surveillance activity at night from the years of 1972 through 1975. So he saw a ton. He totally had some UFO stories. But one of the things that really stuck with him was one evening when he got a call that one of the guards on duty had seen something. And they would survey the area through these starlight scopes and motion detectors. And when looking through a scope, the guard called in a report that in the distance, in the perimeter of the base, there was a very tall man, but not really a man. 
It was more of an ape-like man who was covered in hair and was staring at the ground, pacing back and forth, appearing to be looking for something. The lieutenant had been told when he called it in and kind of like raised the concern higher that he shouldn't do anything. Don't do anything to disturb this animal, this creature. Just watch it. Make sure it doesn't get any closer. And so he repeated this to the guard. He just said, keep an eye on this creature. It stayed for about five minutes, kind of looking at the ground, looking for something. And then finally it left when it was spooked by a helicopter landing nearby and it ran back into the forest. They said it ran almost like a deer, which is really interesting. Oh, what? I'm trying to picture that because deer are so graceful. Right. Like it was galloping. It was I mean, doing pu- puro, puro uh, pirouettes. Pirouettes. Leaps, pure leaps. Leaping and bounding. <laughs> like, See, it's I'm moments like, like this where I'm like, you're, you're saying things and I'm like, oh, well, let me get up and just act it out. Yeah. Do it. Okay. <laughs> this is Bigfoot. looking. He's looking for something. Bigfoot's searching. He's searching. Oh, helicopter's coming. Oh, no. You must disappear. <laughs> it's like Swan Lake for Bigfoot. <laughs> Beautiful. Graceful. Gorgeous. Ooh. Gorgeous. So the next day, the lieutenant is told that what he had seen and what his team had seen was a Bigfoot and that there are many in this area that they have seen over the years. By 1975, video surveillance cameras were mounted in all of the key areas in the base, and Bigfoots appeared in several of the tapes, but all of the footage was always rushed to top security. And this was my concern, so I'm glad that this is happening. Okay. Makes me believe even more. Yeah, so there is there's evidence, apparently, but we don't have access to it. And for a little bit, they thought that... It, they could potentially be classified as an EBE, which is an extraterrestrial biological entity. And soon these Bigfoots found their way into the secret underground tunnels that ran under Edwards Air Force Base. And you know what's interesting is, I remember when we did the Yucca Man episode, I swear there was video posted somewhere, or at least like a still of these creatures walking through the tunnels, and I could not find it anywhere on the internet it was like scrubbed i swear i remember i could draw it what maybe we what jumped timelines maybe you know what? i don't know so fa- okay conspiracy time for conspiracy okay <clears throat> conspiracy <laughs> corner <laughs> conspiracy. <laughs> what if mandela effect was created by the government to try to trick us into believing that things didn't happen because they needed and like they do really small things and change really small things so that the bigger things are less shocking when they change them that's interesting that we're never actually jumping timelines but the government is actually in control but like who i'm like do they remember everything or with it do they jump and have some secret book where it's i'm thinking of like 50 first dates where she pops in the the vhs <laughs> the DVD. At, when yeah, she the yeah VHS. when she wakes up and and she's like, oh, here's my whole life, like a whole explanation of what I missed because she doesn't remember. I guess that is the hard thing. And it kind of comes back to the conversation we were having about humans thinking we're the smartest. It's like, it's. I almost feel like I'm giving humanity too much credit if I'm saying that some person is actually capable of doing all of this. Whereas to me, I don't think human, humans deserve that much credit. I don't think we're that smart and great. If anything, it's like... There's got to be a higher power, whether you believe in God, whether you believe in many gods, whatever you believe in. I feel like the universe is so intelligent and is constantly working its magic. Or maybe we're accidentally doing it, you know, like all those concerns with CERN and everything. Like maybe we're experimenting so much with different things. We have no idea that we're accidentally triggering all of these events i believe it human error okay well anyway i can't find this video if someone out there ha- has it has a screenshot has access to it found is a better person to navigate a better person if you're me. a better person <laughs> let us know if you're better than me please let me know <laughs> anyway i remember seeing this footage but apparently the cameras would catch these bigfoots wandering around the tunnels all the time and after many years of encountering these creatures They were removed as a potential EBE, extraterrestrial biological entity threat, and believed to just be an undiscovered animal, not an alien. But I think it's strange that even if it was an undiscovered animal, that they wouldn't, I guess, like do something about all the Bigfoots wandering around. 
So my question is qual for qualifiers, like alien, is it have to be a species from outside of our, like outside of earth? It's like an unearthly species or is it an intelligence life that is, yeah, I guess what qualifies alien? I don't know because, because yeah, if we think about it, the extraterrestrial biological entity, I would assume most aliens would fit under like who we think of as aliens would fit under biological because I think of them as these living beings unless there's some sort of different classification. And what does entity mean? Does it mean like just it, something that exists like a, a being or does this mean like an actual ghost? Do they have different classifications? Okay, well, this this is what really like, okay, there's a there's a scene in Oppenheimer where he says, he talks about matter and how basically matter has convinced us that our hands are solid and cannot pass through one another but it's a concept it's a theory and like it's basically all of these atoms and i'm not using the correct scientific terms but it's all of this energy compounded so tightly together that we've formed solid but it's it's so fragilely put together that so it's really just like density that yeah that keeps my fingers from going through but if something happened it could separate and they could pass through each other we could yeah. ju all just be oh. stardust again buttholes we should put a censorship sensor just a little graph face. around it yeah. a little a little bigfoot smiling oh, winking bigfoot on it. <laughs> leia walked across the camera if any, anyone's listening and doesn't know why we're suddenly talking about buttholes Leia, Leia came said hello but yeah, when you think too hard about any of these concepts, it it really does. It's a bit like take, it's like the Matrix. It's once you step, if you, once you take that pill, there's no going back. And so sometimes it's easier just to prevent yourself from going beyond that wall of the conversation because you don't know what's on the other side. I almost feel I don't know if this makes me delusional or or what, but I feel like. If I knew all of those, things, like the the more that I convinced myself of these things, like if if someone came out and told me all the secrets of the universe and everything, I really don't think I would have this existential crisis. I think I'd just be like, wow, okay. Well, then how much more interesting is it that I get to be here and experience life in this way? And I guess I'll choose to do things that I enjoy for the time that I get to act as a human right here. And I'd probably spend it gardening. <laughs> In a commune. I think I will. Yeah. yeah. I'll do cool things. And I think that's a cool thing to do as a human. It's all about inner peace, your own inner harmony. I think I'm getting there. I think we are. Okay. So, yeah. So they're like, this is a deep I don't episode. Know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew Bigfoot, Bigfoot would get us into us. our feels? I know. We're still searching with Bigfoot. Another one of the interviewed officers stated that he had asked why they don't capture one of the Bigfoots to prove their existence to the world. And he was told that it would not be allowed because none of the activity at the base was supposed to be revealed. And Bigfoots are real. They're all over the area. But if they admitted that, that would surely draw way too much public attention to the base. And it would, you know, interfere with other things going on that are apparently much larger than Bigfoot. Another officer said that he had seen the animals fairly frequently, and one time he saw a Bigfoot that was over 10 feet tall. Another time he witnessed a mother and her young Bigfoot child. And then another time he spotted a group of five Bigfoots together. So it would appear that yes, sometimes they're so low, but they do move as a group. Like they have these social units. It's just that they don't always move as a pack. He said that they were fully covered in hair with the exception of their palms, their feet, and their faces. Their faces were ape-like, their feet more similar to ours but without an arch. He also stated that they aren't nearly as rare as people assume, but they're in, for the most part, entirely nocturnal in his experience and quite shy. They spook easily. They're very good at concealing themselves. He said that they tracked them numerous times through the desert and even these like large, huge, hairy creatures amongst desert open landscape. He said sometimes it was almost near impossible to catch them and like spot them because they were just so good at camouflaging and cloaking themselves and being completely still amongst. It's wild that they're so massive and yet yeah. can cloak themselves 
I know. so expertly. It is. Okay. This man also believed that maybe they possess some sort of telepathy, or at least he'd heard that, because they seem to know where and with whom they're in danger and where they're safe. So it was basically, it like came up because it was like, they frequent the Air Force Base a lot, and they think, some of them theorize it's because they know that they're safe at the Air Force Base because no one's going to do anything because no one has done anything for a long time. And there's such strict rules and procedures that there's not going to be someone who goes off course and like shoots and captures a Bigfoot because they're probably going to be in jail for the rest of their lives or disappeared, you know? Which is actually interesting, which is probably why so many Bigfoot, like it's almost a paradoxical in the sense that, or ironic maybe. And I know people use that word wrong. And so I might be using it incorrectly in this moment, but like the way that Bigfoot hunters so desperately want to catch Bigfoot. And we talked about in part two, where like a lot of these Bigfoot hunters have this desire to kill. And so, which is so upsetting because then they are directly putting the thing that they so desperately want to find more than anything in the world in harm's way. And if they have this ability to understand and perceive when they are threatened, then the the chances of a Bigfoot hunter finding them is going to be a lot less, a lot less. Yeah, no, absolutely. And a, in a minute, I'll go into some of the considerations people have given to that and how to protect Bigfoots from hunters and from the people who who want them most in a in the greediest of ways. Okay. So basically, if these things are, if these creatures are biological animals, it's believed that they're also spiritual ones, that they they trust their instincts, they have unlocked abilities beyond the majority of humans, yet it still doesn't really explain, at least for the Edwards Air Force Base, if they are these like physical, biological beings that are are grounded here on Earth, how they are able to get past the guarded and secure tunnels at Edwards Air Force Base, which is supposed to be like a Fort Knox situation, and how they aren't captured when they're in the actual facilities. Because apparently, yeah, they're seen wandering outside and no one does anything about that. But when they're in the tunnels, officers do go into the tunnels to try to intercept the Bigfoots, but the creatures just suddenly disappear. Huh. Then we have no idea what they are. And basically, some people absolutely believe Bigfoots could exist, but what they could be is up for debate. But if they do exist, they surely would be considered an endangered species given how small their population must be, which is likely what triggered a few of the Sasquatch preservation laws. Woo! Woo! In 1969, Scamania, I'm butchering this, I know, County Ordinance Number 6901 and the 1999 Whatcom County Resolution Number 92043, both counties in Washington State, protect Bigfoot creatures. If they do exist, they are now protected from hunters, allowing them to fall within wilderness conservation and preservation laws. They're considered an endangered animal, and you are not allowed to harm them, touch them, interfere with them, kill them. In 2018, a Bigfoot researcher, Claudia Ackley, she filed a lawsuit with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife for failing to acknowledge the existence of Bigfoot after she had an encounter with what she says is, quote, a Neanderthal man with a lot of hair. She had contacted emergency services when she came in contact with this thing, because I think she was so scared. And she was told that it was a bear. And she actually passed away this year. But up until her passing, she ran an online support group for individuals claiming to experience psychological trauma as a result of an encounter with a Sasquatch. I love that that existed and I hope someone has taken over it. I know. Hopefully they they did. Probably, right? There's so many people. (laughs) Yeah. And it is a traumatic thing. Like to put it in perspective, imagine us not knowing what a grizzly bear is or what a wolf is or something or a crocodile and or a shark like the, the things that people are so scared of and we come in contact with it or even like an elephant imagine not knowing what an elephant is and seeing one for the first time and it kind of charging at you and everyone telling you you're making it up and that actually that elephant was just a that was a common house cat. You got confused. Like that would be so traumatizing. So I'm glad that that exists. Yeah. So one thing is for sure, Bigfoot has stolen the hearts and the fascination of many, me included. There are numerous museums displaying Bigfoot evidence, quite a few videos capturing supposed Bigfoots, some which have yet to be debunked, a number of podcasts, books, documentaries, and television shows dedicated to chronicling and researching Bigfoot evidence, many conferences and festivals which are attended by thousands of people, 
annually and often have Bigfoot calling competitions as part of the festivities. I was just going to say, to end this episode, do we need to do our calls? Oh, almost, but I'm not ending it quite yet. Okay, great. Yes. So basically, I I literally wrote, I'm not going to conclude this episode with some suggestion of where to go or some fact about why Bigfoot could be real. Instead, I'm going to end with one final story. It is a Bigfoot encounter, which I heard about a few years ago when I watched the documentary Missing 411 Hunted. And it has stuck with me and it has stuck with my mom who watched it with me. Fun. And then I have a story from a listener. Okay. Lovely. It is the Sierra Sounds, the Sierra Nevada Sounds. That's its nickname. One of the many recorded Bigfoot sounds that has not been able to be debunked or disputed. The sounds recorded suggest that Bigfoots have a rudimentary language through complex spoken sounds. This series of recordings have been analyzed by professionals who can't identify the creature that is making the sound, but based off of it, has theorized that these animals making the sound have to be much larger than a human, or at least not human at all because the frequencies of the sounds can't be duplicated by human vocals. Dr. R. Lynn Curlin, professor of electrical engineering at University of Wyoming, was first sent these tapes, which I will play a part of it later. You are? Oh my gosh. Yes. Okay. He was first sent these tapes and in his analysis of these tapes, he said that the sounds based on pitch and sound seem like it's from more than one creature. He also said the tape does not appear to have any speed alterations and does not appear to be altered at all in terms of pre-recording or re-recording audio over the sounds that we're hearing. So basically, all of the experts who have listened to it have basically said, this, there, there's nothing that they suggests can't, this was faked. Right. And all. then they can't place it to be anything else either. They can't place it to be anything else. And the only reason they can't identify like for sure that this is Bigfoot is because apparently within the science c- community with zoology and, and primatology and what whoever else is involved whatever ology you have to whatever ology you have to have a visual on the animal making the sound for confirmation that it's coming from that animal so you can't su- just suggest or theorize it's coming from a bigfoot so basically the only thing that's stopping them from saying this is from a bigfoot is the fact that they haven't physically witnessed a bigfoot making the noise and have that recorded okay that makes sense by like a scientist okay yes so retired u.s navy cryptologic linguist scott nelson wow i can't even uh, he's an expert in language and i can't even say his title (laughs) Uh, but he was trained in all of the deceptive practices and voice communications when he was in the u.s navy and now he's retired and he has an interest in, in language and he was doing i think it was i was reading that he was like doing a school project or something with his son and it was suggested just kind of like a silly project that his son would do like a research paper on bigfoot and his son was like what do bigfoot sound like and so he looked up bigfoot sounds and that's when he came across these tapes and he was like oh my god as a as a professional linguist he was like this does not sound like it could be from human origin and this kind of sparked all of this research that he would do into sounds made by Bigfoots. It's all from like a a goofy little school project that his son was doing. So he got in contact with the people who originally recorded these sounds and has been studying them. And he said he does not believe that it could be faked. It's definitely not human. And it does sound like a language. He said both of the creatures' voices overlap on one another on the tapes, almost interrupting each other like you would naturally in conversation. Like a podcast. Like a podcast. And he also said the people taking the video, their voices are speaking, mimicking, and whispering over one another and over these animals. And knowing that these tapes have not been altered in any way, it would be basically impossible to replicate that or or to fake that. So he said it doesn't appear to be faked. It doesn't appear to be tampered with. And he also believes that these tapes have up to three Bigfoots recorded communicating with each other. And he has been working to decipher the language. He has even gone with one of the original men who were there, who took the recording to that exact spot so that he could hear more of the sounds, which he did. He heard more of the Bigfoot sounds in person, but he was still unable to transcribe and translate the language, but he's working on it. He's hopeful. 
That must be so hard though, because he only has that amount of footage or like sound, like that much recording. Mm -hmm. That how can you transcribe a language from such a short amount of time? Well, and it's also so difficult, I would imagine, to do it out of context without seeing physically what people what the Bigfoots are doing, right? Like Right. It's not like if you, if he saw me handing he could, you something yeah. and saying Oka Uka. Uka. And Uka. then he's like, Oh, it's either drink or water or take or, yeah. or something, you know? Like he he doesn't have any of those clues. Ooh. What a cool job. <laughs> right? It's yeah, I mean, this was I think he was retired and this is kind of like what he's doing in his retirement. So very cool. Very. I'm going to tell you how these recordings were acquired and then I'm going to play a very small snippet at the end, a 90 second snippet of the recordings, which you can buy online and download. And there's 90 minutes of recorded Bigfoot sounds. Okay, that's way more than I thought there would be. 90 oh, no. minutes. I'm going to play you 90 seconds of 90 minutes. Okay, yeah. I'm listening. I'm here for it. And I'm also going to link in the show notes the uh, website where you can purchase them if you want to listen to the whole thing. Okay. Okay. So between Yosemite and Tahoe, there is a campsite. It's location unknown to the general public and certainly illegal to have a campsite there. But it was used by a group of friends and hunters since the 50s. And every year, this group would traverse eight miles of wilderness and relocate their campsite 4,000 feet above the Sierra Nevada mountains. The springs would start there. The water was the freshest, the air, the, the cleanest. It was just a really lovely place to be. And so this group of friends, they, this original group of four people who were hunters were Warren and Lewis Johnson, Bill McDowell, and Ron Moorhead. Ron is the one who now sells the recordings. So they would continue to come back year after year on this annual trip and they said this area felt as close to heaven as they'll ever get. They had quite a few rules for the camp too. It was very serious business. Like they wanted to respect the nature, respect the hunt, respect each other. No alcohol could be could be had while they were up there. There was, you know, like everything you you pack in, you pack out. Like they were in and out in the cleanest and tightest way possible. Each year they had a 100% success rate with hunting. They had a great time there. They always got a deer. It was just an awesome time for them. And this started in the 50s. In the late 70s, so 20 years into this annual trip, Ron stopped hunting, but continued to go back annually to camp and spend time with his friends. And this is a bit perplexing to all of them because they had spent a lot of time up there already. But when they returned in 1971, this was the very first year that they encountered odd things. When the sun set, odd noises began to emanate through the woods. It sounded big. It sounded close. Hmm. <laughs> Sometimes this would happen in the dead of night, waking them from their slumber, and these men would lay there, scared, listening to these sounds that sounded like grunts and screams and whistles and whoops and raps on the trees and, and on rocks. And these noises, they just came night after night. Sometimes the men would be outside around their campfire, around their camp stove, and these sounds would start up, and they would quickly move into their shelter. And their shelter was was basically a bunch of logs and branches that they had pinned between a few trees and had this giant tree trunk to create this mini shelter. And they would use this large log as the door entrance. I feel like I described that horribly, but when I play the sounds in the video, I'm gonna include three photos that Ron, uh, that Ron Moorhead has on his website. How much does it cost to buy all 90 minutes? I think they're only like between 10 and 15 bucks each. So oh, okay. under 40 bucks for 90 minutes of Bigfoot noises. Okay. So basically it was like this tiny little wooden hut. And, and when the noises would happen, they would run in there and then grab the big log and shut themselves in the camp because they were so scared of what this thing was. They had no idea what the thing was. And so they didn't want to risk their safety. And they would just like kind of huddle terrified in their camp until the sun rose every day. Every day. The fact that they continue to put up with it is like, is funny. But they didn't just like pack their stuff up for <laughs> the know. first time and say goodbye. Maybe it was because they were hunters that they were just like, you know, they had their guns. So maybe they thought. And they knew that they're not like they're in the wilderness. It's not their territory. Yeah, totally. Okay. They had a lot of respect for the land already. Yeah. The next year, they bring an investigative reporter back with them to this campsite. His name is Al Barry. And they were like, you got to hear these sounds. There's something odd here. 
Al Berry was not a Bigfoot believer. He didn't go into this being like, I'm going to find Bigfoot at all. He went in to be an investigative reporter to see what these guys are experiencing, to see if there's any truth to it, to, to understand what could be going on. While he's there, all these noises happen again. He records 90 minutes of audio throughout these various recordings, all Bigfoot, or we believe to be Bigfoot. In the audio, these men are mimicking the sounds back to the animals in an attempt to communicate with them. And here's what they heard. I'm going to send you the clip, and then we're going to press play at the exact same time so we can... Okay, what? Well, listen together. Yeah. Okay, ready, go. And you can tell the difference between human and yeah, not. Totally. There's two of them across the creek at the big rocks. The scream is... Sounds like the language. I think it's like words. It almost sounds like barking. Yeah, it's like barking and then it's like monkey. Whoa! Wow. There's 90 Isn't minutes of that. 90 minutes. I don't think it's all like succinct yeah, yeah, yeah. like it is in, in this clip where it's all together. It's probably scattered. But I when I first heard it, because like in the beginning when they're like, ooh, ooh, I was looking at bear noises, moose noises, elk calls. I was, I was listening to all of that because it does kind of sound like an elk, but an elk is not that deep. But it it's also does have like some like bird. It almost sounds jungle like. Yeah, and so a lot of people have also said that they believe that Bigfoot has the ability to mimic other animals. And so maybe not all of the what we're hearing is actual language. Maybe some of it is just them mimicking their surroundings and trying to present themselves as a bird or like parroting what they hear in the woods around them. But this is what those guys were hearing. Can you imagine not knowing and being so deep into the woods where there's nobody else around you? It's just you and like three of your buddies and you're in this makeshift camp, like hidden behind a tree trunk, and you're all huddled in your fort until sun comes up, terrified. So this is what they would hear night after night, year after year, after it all started in the 70s. They would sometimes find footprints, large footprints in the snow or in the pine. And after a couple of years, they wondered if maybe this thing was, or these things, these animals were trying to scare them away. Odd things continued to happen. They would hear these unidentified animalistic noises, but they would also experience other strange phenomena. And it's almost like alien-like. So they said that they remember one time hearing their camp being ripped apart. They heard pots banging and bags being tossed and the entire thing was just being tossed. And so they were like, is it a bear, a moose, Bigfoot? Like what, what the hell is happening? When they go outside, when the noises finally stop and they feel like they're able to leave their shelter safely, they remove the large wood trunk from their shelter and they peek outside and nothing has been disturbed at all. It was like the forest had mim mimicked the sound of the camp being destroyed, but nothing had been moved. Nothing was out of place. That's so bizarre. And, yeah. and then it makes me question like timelines and different universes because it's like, was there a moment? I don't know. I don't know. And I feel like I the, the, the like things that I can come up with don't actually make sense. So by saying them, it's like, well, okay, thanks, Sabrina. That's dumb. But but I'm trying to make sense of it. And based on the knowledge that we have had and or like the very minimal knowledge is not the right word, but basically this idea of ripples in time and 
when we talk about paranormal stuff where it's like someone sees a spirit, but then it's like they make contact with each other and they're like, wait a second. It's almost like you stepped into their space and they stepped into yours and you're both existing in that space, but in a different time. Well, and there might be something really weird going on in terms of timelines and whatnot, because there was another time that they, this group was outside and they said the entire sky sounded like a tuning fork. Like when you hit the fork, it's like, they said the entire sky the entire like everything around them was just this vibration this vibrational tone here's a question you know how when a star implodes it creates like a black hole and we don't really know what exists inside a black hole but we almost feel like it's another multitude of universes like yeah what if what if we are we exist within a black hole like what if we are a black hole we could yeah what if what if a black hole is a like living conscious thing and where just it's hallucination. <laughs> it's tripping on We're tripping, and honestly. <laughs> we are the result of it. Uh, oh. What is life? Okay. So, of course, they're hearing these vibrations. They're encountering these odd things. And there's a bunch of Bigfoot. So why wouldn't there be orbs in the woods. Of course, that's a, a natural next step. And that is exactly what they encountered. There were all of these orbs, these blue orbs, these white lights that would move through the forest. And sometimes they would be in a ball. Other times they'd be almost like this long snake-like straight line that would traverse through like a few feet off of the ground, just kind of weave through the different trees. And so they thought it was so odd and they they had no idea what they were experiencing, but all of these odd things kept happening up here. I don't know what to make of it. I was kind of like, could this also be Bigfoot transition into, If it, is this sort of like hybrid of spirit and living? Is this the spirit version we're seeing of it? Or maybe are, are these spirits and extraterrestrials just as interested in Bigfoot as we are? And so they're visiting the Bigfoots in the Sierra Nevadas and checking in on their activity, making sure they're safe and we're just witnessing it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know what we're talking about anymore because it's just so confounding. <laughs> I've, I've truly, I've lost, I've lost brain capacity. There's so much. There's so many theories. Yeah. That's the thing. I feel like with so many paranormal entities and cryptids, there's like one or two theories about what this thing could be. Bigfoot is a multitude because it's so, it just defies everything we know. And so, and it, it's kind of unpredictable at times. Not really, though. Like, it, it's unpredictable in the way that we don't have an explanation for packaging everything that it does into one logical puzzle piece. So that's why it feels so confusing, because we think we know something, but then it conflicts with another thing that it does in our minds. So we don't know what this thing is. But Ron Moorhead, he still returns to the area to this day, time after time, looking for answers. His original group of hunters also return. They now bring their kids to join them hunting and, and camping. And the structure has since been taken down because the U.S. Forest Service discovered it and you're not allowed to do that. So they took that down, but they still go and camp and hunt. And the group is also very selective about who they take to the area. They do not want to expose the exact location to people. They, they want it to remain as it is, which is largely untouched by humans. Do they still hear the noises every year? I think so. Yeah. Should we try to interview Ron? I'm sure. Uh, maybe he would. He definitely wouldn't take us there. That's fine. We don't we, need to go. I think we should. We should yeah, let's hit him, him up. Okay. Let's ask him. But yeah, so he, they, he, Ron and his group, they do not want the area to be disturbed. They do not want it to be destroyed. They want the Bigfoots to live peacefully there amongst them because after the, all these decades, it seems that despite them both very much knowing about each other's presence, there's, there's nothing... Uh, to indicate that they are challenging each other or going to harm one another. So when Ron and his group do visit, they are reminded of the Bigfoots in the area through their whistles, their screams, their large footprints in the forest bed, and they believe. And so do I. And the question we ask is, do you? What do you think of Bigfoot after this three-parter? What the heck did we talk about? Did we come any closer to kind of finding some answers or have we confused ourselves even more? Or uh, yeah, is the honest truth that we will literally never know? I just, I don't know. <laughs> I fully believe but I have no idea what they are. I think that's the hardest part is for everything that we know and for how many years they have been in existence and the amount of encounters and 
small pieces of it, of evidence that we continue to gather on them, they are still just as confusing. And then the more we find out, it's almost even more confusing. Yeah. Do you want to give your best Bigfoot call before giving us a, an encounter? Yes. Let me grab my kitty cat. Wait, are you ready for Bigfoot calls? Let's see. I want to see what her reaction is to mine. Okay. Ready? <clears throat> yeah. <coughs> Warming up. Ooh, that kind of uh, sounded like one. Ooh, uh, okay. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> That's so good. You got really deep. See, I feel like you're almost disproving the existence because they were like, there's no way humans can even vocalize in that range. And I feel like you got right there. All right, let's hear yours. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of what the noise just sounded like. It was like, ooh, ooh, ook, ook, ook. Ooh, that's mine. That was a good one. Yours definitely had more of a language to it. Yeah, I'm just repeating what I heard in the, mine was in the just video. Sounds. But, how wild though. Yeah. Wow. <sighs> okay, I have a listener story. This is from our listener Autumn. It's a kind of short one, and so it has. I'm gonna I'm gonna read both of the stories on Patreon. I asked for encounters with Bigfoot and babysitter horror stories. So I got both in Autumn's email. Hello, Sabrina and Corinne. My name's Autumn. I absolutely love your podcast and I'm excited to be an only phantom on Patreon as well. I saw your call to action and thought I would tell my stories because I have one for Bigfoot and for babysitting. I have plenty of ghost stories too, and I'll compile those one time. As for the Bigfoot encounter, the story comes from my mom who grew up in a small town here in Canada. As you know, we have so many Bigfoot encounters and lots of forests. My mom and her cousins had been playing outside in the trees and bushes when they heard something near them, but didn't quite see what it was. After hearing the noise, my mom remembers smelling something horrible, like a wet dog, but worse. It was really terrifying because they had heard rustling behind the bushes, but had only smelt it and felt its presence without ever fully being able to see the thing. See another example. My mom said that most of her cousins don't remember this occurrence as adults or just thought the memory was some make-believe game that they convinced themselves it was not real. My mom, however, remembers smelling and hearing that thing in the woods and she knows it was real. She has a feeling it was not a forest animal, but Bigfoot, we believe. We fully believe. My babysitting horror story is not paranormal, but still so scary. I was maybe 15 or 16 years old and I was babysitting at a family friend's house. So I felt pretty comfortable because I knew the family. However, this time was different because a few days before I was babysitting for them, they had experienced an attempted break-in. Now I was babysitting at their house all alone at night. Oof, I was scary. scared an intruder would attempt another break-in. It was so creepy because it would be like 3 a.m. in the middle of the cold and dark winter and they lived near a train track. So randomly, I would hear this train blaring and it would startle me. I was so on edge. The night ended up going fine though. I never heard anything and I made it home safely. But the scariest part was when I found out the news the next day. I found out the parents I babysat for had found shoe prints outside in the snow on the side of their house that had been fresh from the night before because it had just Stop. snowed. I never oh babysat gosh. there again after that. I was too scared. Thanks for reading, girls. Love your episodes. Love Autumn. Oh my gosh, my heart is going pit a pat Terrifying. For this person. That's so, so scary. I would never babysit again. Like, regardless, for this person, for anyone, I would never be alone ever. That, I'm so That's curious -death where experience. the footprints were, but I imagine that this person was just like watching. Watching, stalking. <sighs> this is why everyone needs curtains and curtains that aren't just like i feel like a lot of people have sheer curtains myself included where yeah you can't see out but people can see in you need like full-on blackout curtains where people cannot see inside your house at night also if you don't have a security system get that or even if you can't afford one just put the security system like the sticker. sticker and like sign because then you know someone might see that and just be like oh not gonna risk it right I think yeah. there is a statistic. It, it says like if you even just have that sign, there's uh -huh. safety. And like a beware of dog or something. Or even like beware uh, of a Bigfoot. college house. Beware of Bigfoot. Be beware of the human that lives inside because she is batshit crazy. That will be mine. Because she believes in Bigfoot. Because <laughs> there there ain't <laughs> nothing she won't do to survive. Well, <laughs> let me tell you that. 
Uh, I will oh, poop man. in your mouth if if I if capture you. Be. <laughs> Listen, I have terrible IBS and constipation, but if I need to survive, it will happen. Yeah, you will. You will be captive for some time, so. <laughs> You, you don't want that. You know, it's really you funny. Don't, Just you to, don't want us to play Bigfoot documentaries on loop for, for <laughs> eight days before we release you into the woods and say, good luck. Um, this is such a pivot. But so my sister, my niece, she's um, two months now, but she. Um, oh, my gosh. I can't believe she's already two months. I know. I think by the time this comes out, she's almost three months. But it is so funny to me how like she immediately I'm like, you are. A part of our family my whole family has indigestion and bad like bowel movements and she is the gassiest little girl ever oh. and i am like i'm so sorry for you but you are definitely a deanna roga oh but she's young it'll it'll get solid soon maybe or she'll just be a gassy little girl i mean i never grew out of it <laughs> <laughs> and neither did bigfoot we Okay, what? these stories though, like Autumn's yeah. mom's experience, I totally believe that was Bigfoot because it just it hits all of the all of the the markers for like, did you encounter a Bigfoot? It's like an unseen mm -hmm. looming large entity that yep. reeks. Like the stench is horrible. And I feel like we all know the stench of certain like wildlife and farm life, because there's just like we're around it enough right like if you go to a petting zoo or is it like you you know the smells and it it's i've never encountered a bigfoot so i don't know what the stench is like but it seems like it's bad people that do it is so unlike anything else and so overpowering that and without a doubt you it's just unmistakably bigfoot. something or foul. you're hearing bigfoot near bigfoot yeah. who wow. bigfoot are we Love starting him. a bigfoot podcast now Love are we them. just uh and we'll pivoting we should a bunch of should, Bigfoot um, podcasts on my list of binge and listen to okay I actually had an idea so we have Portland is like the first show on a weekend we should go a day early and do like Bigfoot stuff the day before oh that's a great idea wait it's funny because Nikita it, she texted me the other day because she was like where does Bigfoot live because they were in Montana camping and John really wanted to buy a Bigfoot t-shirt or like bigfoot paraphernalia and uh she didn't believe i don't think she believed that bigfoot was actually living in montana i was like oh i think bigfoot's over there he, he can buy he can buy his shirt yeah it's allowed yeah oh Dang. man okay well if you've seen bigfoot or if you believe in bigfoot or if you don't believe in bigfoot let us know email us your encounters email us your paranormal stories to two girls one ghost podcast at gmail.com you're, we are resuming paranormal stories starting next week, but uh, Bigfoot is always a part of our hearts because we are all Bigfoot. We deserved it. We waited six years. Yeah. <laughs> but also these, these were, it's paranormal in a sense. It's supernatural. It totally is. Two girls, one Bigfoot. We love you all. Come see us on tour. We're doing an entire fall tour in 32 cities in the U.S. and one show in Toronto, Canada. Please come see us. We have so much fun and spookiness. Mm -hmm. That's going to happen. You might leave haunted. We might leave haunted. Who knows? Yes. Join our Patreon. Buy merch. Watch us on YouTube if you want to see the photos and videos and Leia yowling with another cat. Um, and uh, what else? We love you. We love you. Shout out to our team. Thank you, Christina, for editing all of the audio and video that we put out on various platforms. Thank you to Avery for helping to coordinate the tour so we can actually go. And thank Woo. you to Loren, who is helping us with social media also so that we can go on tour. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all of you. We love you so much. Thank you for being here with us for six freaking years and six more. And we will see you on the other, other side. side.